And we really appreciate everybody making the time. I know this is uh, busy. We assumed that it would be easier to do this after the, um, the North American was over, hoping that most people were home and able to join. Um, but um, I do know that we will uh, take some minutes and, uh, and Allie has very kindly agreed to record for us so we can hopefully have some recordings. We're um, gonna, gonna uh, then go through this agenda. The shared agenda, of course, to begin with is, is um, both the Division Directors Association and the, and the Training Directors Association, and then we'll break up into um, subgroups. So here's our agenda for our first hour. Um, and and uh, uh, we'll talk about these things. And these are your various presenters. We're going to go through updates for both the um, division directors and the training directors. We'll do an ADP update as well as an AAP update. And then we're going to talk about ATS, COPS, and DEI before we go out into breakouts. Next slide. So I just want to start by saying we have some special guests on the call today. I'm I'm hoping that Carrie Smith joined us. She was um, supposed to. Carrie is the new chief of learning um, for ATS and is gonna be a wonderful resource for us uh, to be able to help us uh, with, um, with, with our agendas and, uh, and where we're uh, gonna go from here. Carrie, are, are you on and would you like to say hello? Yep, I'm there. Um, you are. I see you. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for letting me join today. Um, I'm looking forward to working with you all. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we also um, gratefully have Karen Kolashaw joining us as the ATS CEO. Thank you, Karen, uh, for being a part of this uh, of this meeting too. And um, do you have anything you would like to say to the group? You'd think I'd know by now. Um, similarly, um, just thanks for letting me listen in um, and, and glad to be here. It's good to see everyone. Great, thank you, Karen. So I'm gonna do the few little division director updates that we have. And if you'll go to the next slide, Ben. So just to remind everyone about our structure as the division, as the division directors association, um, our officers uh, have two-year terms. We elected ATS, which means this coming ATS in 2023 will be an election uh, year for us to elect new officers. And then after someone is elected this, uh, this spring, they will take over in their role in, at the NACFC in the fall. Um, so for the last three years, this has been these have been the leadership folks. Chris Orman is our past immediate past president. I'm the current president, and Terry Laguna is our president elect. Uh, we also have at large members that are nominated by the executive committee, and these, those also change at ATS. So so far right now, we have Robin Dieterding, Paul Moore, and Stephanie Davis. We also have a nominating committee that will be responsible for coming forward with nominations for the elections for the leadership of the division directors. Um, that nominating committee will also change at ATS. And um, I'm throwing this out here because when we go into our breakouts, I'm going to ask people who are interested in either being on the nominating committee or um, being nominated for a leadership position in the Division Directors Association to please put their names forward. So um, here's your call to action to think about it for the next hour before we, uh, before we break out. Next slide. So just to remind you what we work on. Um, so um, we are responsible for the um, uh, the resident development scholarships, the pediatric pulmonary resident development scholarships. Um, we are still a little bit on pins and needles waiting for the ATS to tell us that that's going to be funded for this next year. We were hoping we'd have an answer for you for that by today, uh, but we will um, continue to pursue that. And you should be on the lookout as uh, division directors and as training directors for the applications because we'd love to have interested pediatric residents um, sign up to be a part of the ATS meeting and learn more about what it's like to be in our roles in pediatric pulmonary. 
We continue to work closely with PEPDA on uh, the workforce initiatives and town halls put forward for the workforce initiatives for training, recruitment, and people trying to join our discipline. Um, we'll talk in our breakout a little bit about ATS, but I just wanted to remind everybody that the American Thoracic Society is the group that supports the Pediatric Pulmonary Division Directors Association, and we are ever so thankful for their support. This doesn't happen without them, and I would really encourage all of you as division directors to please Come to ATS, support the international conference, support the initiatives put out by ATS, publicize them, and get your young faculty members as well as your trainees involved. There are so many good ways to be involved in the American Thoracic Society, and this is really what um, makes a difference for us and allows our discipline to be supported in such great ways. So support them back, please. We continue to work on, um, on Basecamp, and, uh, and I just put a little snapshot of what Basecamp looks like there. This is a great forum for division directors to please um, uh, you know, post questions, interact with each other on topics that are of interest. And it's a closed forum so that it's just division directors and people who are signed up to be there. So you can really pretty much talk about anything on that on that. So anybody who doesn't have access to Basecamp, please let me know and I will make sure that you get an invitation so that you guys can join Basecamp. On that same theme, um, if there have been changes in your own divisions or divisions that you know about, new leadership within your divisions, please reach out to us so that we can update our roster and our list and make sure it's as complete as it possibly can be so people get invitations to the things that we want them to be invited to. And then Ali, I wanted to mention that we're still working on the website. And within the American Thoracic Society meeting, uh, I'm sorry, the American Thoracic Society website, there's a special place for the Pediatric Pulmonary Division Directors. Um, Peptida has kind of been built out there, but we're going to do the same thing uh, within the PPDDA. Correct, Allie? She's nodding. We'll talk more about that in our breakout about what's going to go on the website and what you all as division directors want to go on the website. And we'll talk more in our breakout. And I think that's the end of my updates, Ben. Cool. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so first and foremost, I wanted to kind of uh, introduce who we are as the Peptida board, uh, as we have some new members this year. So this is the website that, Car um, that uh, Corey was referencing there on the ATS page. So Peptida has a landing site and uh, Chuck is our past president. Uh, Leva Day is our, uh, we call it vice president, but I, I like president elect better maybe. So maybe we'll change that. Uh, Lara Bache is our secretary treasurer. And then we also have two at-large uh, board members, Liz Fiorino and Steve Kirkby. Okay, so uh, I wanted just to make sure everyone is on the same page here. I think most people are aware of the new updated FTE requirements for program leadership. Uh, they have gone into effect, uh, but I think they'll start being uh, more scrutinized uh, going forward. And this has budgetary concerns potentially for programs. So those who have fe small fellowships, there's really no change in the minimum FTE required for program leadership. Uh, but there were changes for medium and large groups. The medium groups actually went down and the large groups went up. Uh, we did provide feedback. Uh, I'm not sure how much of that feedback was really listened to because I don't think there were really any changes after the open comment section. And so uh, this will may or may not be an issue for programs going forward. I wanted to let everyone know of some educational opportunities and webinars that uh, Peptida is planning for the next year. Uh, Chuck is going to be helping us to lead a joint webinar with the CF Foundation after the new year, and this will be focused on uh, how to successfully write a training grant uh, for incoming fellows uh, and to uh, increase the number of our fellows that get funding from the CF Foundation, if that's uh, something of interest. Liz is going to be uh, leading a virtual career panel in the early spring with the hope that that could lead as kind of a springboard to 
potential in, per in person interactions and recruitment opportunities uh, for trainees who are looking for faculty positions uh, at ATS. And we uh, were informally accepted uh, that's uh, to lead a session at the Center for uh, Career Development at ATS in the spring. Uh, so this is going to be building upon the virtual format that uh, COPS and APBD put together last July with the idea of getting more interaction between trainees and programs. And we're going to be doing this in person uh, at ATS. And uh, the reason I say informally accepted is because I've been told we're they're accepting it, but we haven't gotten a time or date yet because they're still working that out. Once they do, we'll be sending out information to people about how to participate uh, both in presenting your own programs, but also just being there to uh, interact with people. And then Laura and Steve are going to be uh, running a webinar in the fall, uh, helping people figure out how to pick a research project, but also how to publish in more non-traditional scholarship areas that are, I think are becoming more prevalent uh, as we go here. Uh, last year, we successfully implemented PEPTIDA training awards for case reports and research abstracts for uh, trainees. So that was all the way from medical students to fellows were eligible, uh, and we're going to do that again this year. It was kind of neat because it gave us the opportunity to read all of the cool stuff uh, that all the trainees are doing from around the world, really, uh, which I've never really done before. So we're going to be uh, doing that again this year, uh, which was pretty neat. A uh, couple opportunities. Uh, ATS is looking for quick hits submissions, especially from fellows and uh, junior faculty. So that's an option for people who want to um, publish uh, interesting cases. And then pediatric pulmonology is looking for a couple things. Um, they're trying to, we talked about this before, that they want to expand their pool of reviewers and they want to really have people who are asked to do reviews try to bring in a fellow or a junior faculty to help mentor them on how to review an article uh, with the idea of expanding the pool of reviewers going forward. And then uh, I wanted to make people aware of the clinical, clinical curiosity uh, category in the journal. So I'm the associate editor for this section and it's kind of neat, it's a new category. And what we've done is we've transformed the passive case report that really is impossible to get published nowadays into a dynamic interactive educational experience with learner reflection and podcasts. And so we're, we published four cases, two are uh, been accepted for publication, will be in the journal soon. And I encourage people if they have cases to go ahead and submit them. It's really fun, it's educational, and uh, there's a very high acceptance rate on these right now. And then the final thing I wanted to say um, about recruitment is that we're not talking about recruitment today. Uh, our plan is to uh, have an in-depth discussion in the spring, kind of like we did last year. Uh, hopefully, we'll, uh, some data is already coming out, but hopefully we'll have more data. And the idea is to share best practices and plans going forward. Uh, and please, uh, if people have questions or comments, uh, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll keep going here. So I think next, uh, Deborah, are you here? I am. All right, welcome, thank you. Thank you, so you're in charge, right? All right, awesome. So we're gonna go quickly through some ABP updates and I'm happy to take questions if we have time. So go ahead, Ben. Uh, I'm I'm supposed to appreciate you all, so consider yourselves appreciated from the ABP. I'm, I'm speaking as the sub board chair, but this comes from everybody. Um, you know, most of us that do work for the ABP is volunteering, um, and so uh, thank you. Uh, and the next slide uh, is is also just a note from the new president and CEO Judy Schechter. Um, the ABP is having meetings on campus, although most committees now are hybrid. So you'll have some things in person and some things uh, virtual. Uh, and Judy is always willing to talk to folks, so feel free to reach out if you have questions. Next slide, please. So this is your current subboard. Uh, at the end of this year, I will rotate off, and Jane Gross will uh, be the new chair for the next couple of years. And uh, Don Simon and Caroline Okiori will be the new two subboard members because I am rotating off, and Daniel Weiner is also rotating off um, as well. Uh, so these are the people to look out for if you have other questions. Next slide, please. 
I really want uh, everybody, program directors and uh, division chiefs, to pay attention to this. There are a lot of ways to get involved in the AVP, and one of the things that they're putting a big emphasis, just as ATS is as well, is getting people to nominate themselves to make sure we have a diverse representation on all the committees. So please go to the volunteer tool. You can look at it. You can put yourself in. Uh, I think you can nominate other people, but generally you need to upload your CV and such. So I, I really would encourage folks to do this. You never know where there'll be an opportunity. It's not just on the sub board. There are lots of other committees that folks can get involved in. So please look for the volunteer tool. Next slide, please. I uh, just wanted to show you the numbers. And again, thank you to Sue Woods and Kimberly uh, at the ABP for these slides. But these just show you how many of our fellows took the um, in-service exam. You can see that it ranged over the last five years from 150 to 172 folks, generally fairly split, split out over the, the three years. Uh, next slide, please. And this just shows from 2020, this is our last certifying exam. You can see that the overall pass rate was 80%. Now, again, this was given you know, during COVID, so it was a challenging time for all. Uh, for the first time test takers, so obviously people taking it for the first time, they had an 86% pass rate. For some reason this year, folks that were repeating the exam had a very poor pass rate of 12 and a half percent, which is out of line of where it usually is. I don't know if that's a COVID effect or why, but um, we'll have to just keep an eye on that. The exam is being given, I think, the end of this month. Um, so uh, good luck to all of the young folks taking it. Next slide, please. Uh, this just shows our participation in MOCA PEDS. It looks like about 500 or so of us are eligible. I don't know why only 80 have answered all the questions while 387 have started to. Uh, I don't know if it's just some folks aren't completing all the quarters. I would encourage folks to do it. It's actually kind of fun and it's fairly quick to do. Um, so if you have questions about it, I, I didn't present slides all about Mocha Peds because we've looked at those together a bunch of times, but if you have questions about it, I am happy to chat. Uh, next slide, please. So just a slide uh, on absences from training to remind folks that uh, the trainees can all get a month a year for vacation, illness, et cetera. Um, but in three-year programs, such as our fellowships, uh, you can request a waiver for up to two additional months. This would give a trainee a total of five months out of the 36 months that they can uh, be off work for a variety of reasons. Um, those That has to be considered elective time. And most importantly, it requires that the program director uh, feels that the trainee is competent, even with those um, two extra months being out, that you still feel that they, have, they are competent to practice solo. Uh, next slide. So you actually ask for a waiver. It used to be in the olden days, you had to actually write a letter and send it in. Now you can do this all on the portal uh, and it's very easy to do. I'm sure some of you have done it. So uh, remember this, you do have to do it near the end of their training because you have to have decided that they're competent. You can't do that, say their first year. Um, and again, the board is always happy to talk to folks about it if you have questions. Uh, next slide. So this is the portal. Hopefully, at least the program directors have been on it. Uh, next slide, please. Just wanted to show at least one or two screenshots about what the portal looks like. And division chiefs probably haven't seen this if they're not program directors. But there's a lot of information on here, right? You can track your fellow roster. You can track whether they registered for the site exam. You can look at your reports there in the middle left, your site exam reports um, uh, from the past as well, so that you can uh, track where somebody is. And then very importantly and super helpful is the bottom left, which is the scholarly activity sign off. So it used to be you had to run around or your coordinator had to run around and get the folks on the SOC to sign the right documentation. This is all now emailed and done electronically. And if you go to the next slide, you can track uh, when the stuff has been mailed to the SOC members. You can see here, Dr. John Doe has had 22 reminders and he has not uh, uh, signed off on the form. So you might want to walk over to John's office and give him a talking to because the trainee cannot sit for the exam uh, if they have not been signed off. But this is really, really helpful. Um, uh, if you have any problems with it, again, the board is happy to talk with you, but hopefully it'll facilitate getting these things signed off much quicker. Uh, next slide. So a few words on EPAs. I'm not going to go through what EPAs are because I assume enough of you know about them by now. But just to know 
that the EPAs are going to be integrated into the certification process by the ABP in 2028, meaning you're going to have to document EPAs uh, and that a fellow has met a minimum threshold that will yet be determined um, to be able to get certain to be able to sit for the exam and be certified by the American Board of uh, Pediatrics. Uh, next slide. So these are just the number of EPAs. There are, it says three to six for specialty uh, specific. We have five in pulmonary um, and there are seven that are common to the subspecialties. And again, the, the board is gonna be working through exactly how they're gonna be doing this. And we are part of a pilot group. If you go to the next slide, Ben, um, oh, sorry. Well, the pilot group will be in two minutes, but this is just uh, David Turner's uh, goal to think about sort of the educational and the assessment continuum. And that's where they feel that EPAs uh, fit in um, from the training environment through initial certification um, and then in on to continuing certification as a part of lifelong learning. So our uh, pilot group, which I think is on the next slide, uh, can, oh, well, see, I'm off. One more. Um, uh, anyway, th yeah, that's fine. This is fine, Ben. Um, really, the goal of this working group is the stuff that was on the prior slide, but these are folks, and I apologize if I left anyone off. I hoped I captured everybody, but we are working with David Turner and the board to just think about how to be helpful to all of you in this implementation of EPAs. What kind of things can we help the board create that'll make it easy for program directors to do what they need to do uh, to, to utilize EPAs? Um, and I think, uh, next slide, Ben. Uh, that was really it. Uh, ben, I'm happy to take questions or answer them in the chat, whatever you and Corey would prefer. Um, I think we're doing okay on time. Uh, did anyone have any questions? I'm sorry that I talked really fast, but Ben told me I had like seven minutes and I got <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so Deb, so with the EPAs, what, I'm sorry, I missed your timeline. When are they thinking we're going to have something available there? Are they going to roll that out as a pilot with us? I think it was, if you go back uh, two slides, Ben, oh, three, two or three slides, Ben, uh, go uh, uh, two more, one more. It's 2028 okay, is when they're going to be in uh, integrated, but we're hoping to have stuff developed sooner. If folks have ideas about what they would like, um, you know, what would be useful, you know, they're doing infographics or thinking about videos. Uh, we're trying to think about what tools we could provide to program directors, but they're only doing that part with us. And I think child abuse may be the other group that's working on EPAs with them as a, as a pilot. And we'll talk about this a little more at the PEPTIDA meeting as well. Great. Thanks, everybody. Uh, let's see, is Chris here or is he stuck in clinic? I don't see him yet. So we can keep going and I can go through Chris's slides um, while we wait for him. So uh, his reminders for us from the American Academy of Pediatrics are that we held a celebration of pediatric pulmonology and sleep medicine this year in, uh, in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, it was beautiful in February and had a nice uh, 94 attendees that were in person. Um, and uh, that included 77 healthcare professionals and 16 faculty. Um, Tom Keens, TK was the recipient of the Edwin L. Kendig Jr. Award, which was really nice. Although TK couldn't be there, um, we gave him that award virtually and he was able to be with us virtually for that presentation. And we tried to cast a, a broad net in terms of the topics that we uh, entertained with asthma, allergy, CF, sleep, aerodigestive imaging, and surgery trauma. So the next date will probably be um, in 2025, uh, looking at this same time frame in February, and, uh, and we'll see where we go from there. If anyone, again, on this call is interested in being involved, wants to help with planning, wants to help um, be a participant, um, uh, please reach out to Chris uh, and we can, we can uh, put those things into our plans. So this is just a list of when the next American County Pediatrics conferences are going to be. And, and when they're usually in, obviously in the fall, and it looks like we're going to be in Washington, D.C., Orlando, and then Denver in the subsequent years. 
there are a lot of opportunities, as there are in all of these areas, for people to be involved with the AAP. Um, and these include a list of things here, the technical review of AAP publications, being a contributor to a newsletter or a website, being an AAP liaison representative to other organizations, which is something that Chris does here for us for the ATS, being involved in advocacy efforts through the AAP. And we have our own advocacy, obviously, within the within the, um, the, within the Pediatric Pulmonary Assembly, and they do work with the AAP. Um, being part of AAP Advocacy Days and conference, conferences, as well as federal advocacy contacts. Um, there are opportunities to be involved in editing and being on the board for prep pulmonology, as well as, of course, reminding you that that's an AAP um, publication that's available for your trainees um, and for yourselves, if you like, uh, to read uh, those reviews. Um, pediatric pulmonology, the, the blue book that was um, in such good and high demand uh, the, in the first iteration is going to have a second edition that's coming out in December of this coming year. And then there is a subspecialty 101 webinar for pediatric pulmonary um, that is housed by the AAP, and that is the website for that if you're interested in sharing that with any trainees or interested trainees. Next slide. Um, so um, there is a trainee membership, uh, there is a trainee position on the executive committee, and the AAP is always interested in having trainee members as well. Um, so again, if you have interested fellows or trainees, please let Chris know. There's an AAP mentorship program directly to try to build leadership in, in, uh, in pediatrics as well as in the subspecialties. And then these are the workforce resources um, that the AAP has. There are fact sheets about pediatric residents, um, fellows, and faculty, um, uh, and where the shortages happen to be, and looking at advocacy across pediatrics, as well as a really nice interactive um, map that shows where all of those board uh, certified um, individuals are by the department by uh, the ABP. I and I think that was the end of Chris's slides. Um, I'll, I'll ask if anybody has any comments or questions specifically. I know, um, you know, from, from a peptide standpoint, you know, Chuck, you and others have worked with some of the resources that the, that the AAP, AAP puts out in terms of workforce. When we were doing the workforce initiatives, those resources were very valuable. And I know there are other resources that you guys probably talk about, but um, they were very valuable for us as we're thinking about um, adding new positions and trying to expand our workforce. So if anyone has any questions, I'll take them or I'll make Chris answer them later. Corey, th those links will be sent out to us, correct? Um, yeah, the slides are all gonna be captured and, um, and will be on, um, on, uh, on, on the website. So you can be able to get them off of the um, base camp. Uh, there's a whole folder there. And so they'll be on the slides and these slides will all be on base camp. Great. Uh, let's see, Paul, are you ready or are you seeing a patient? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> all right. So uh, I know people are tired of seeing me. Um, it's been a while since I was, uh, the chair, but it's uh, Sharon Dell, who's our, our chair, uh, was unavailable today, and uh, Terry Laguna uh, uh, also was not available. So I was I was happy to be able to present on 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 behalf of, of the leadership of our uh, assembly on pediatrics. Next, advance please. And just a reminder of our executive leadership. I mentioned Sharon uh, is the assembly chair. Uh, ben Cop is the program chair, and the program committee has been great at putting together the meeting. Um, uh, the planning committee chair is uh, Sharon McGrath Morrow, which is involved in the ATS proposals, and that I'm the nominating uh, committee chair, and we help put together the officers for next year. Corey, who you've heard from on this meeting, is head of the Division Directors Association, and of course, Ben, who's helping us with the slides, is also the director of the Training Directors Association. Next slide. This is just a reminder of, of how active our assembly is, and this is a this is an overview of the uh, different working groups and committees. And so there's many ways and opportunities to be involved. 
Uh, at last count, I think there's over 200 members of our assemblies that are involved in these different groups and, and things uh, range from involvement on, um, you know, PhD in basic science, certainly the diversity, equity, inclusion advisory group, Robin Cohen's gonna present more about that in a minute. The web committee is the largest group. And then on the right here, we see some of the very specific um, interest groups related to different disease processes that are so important within our group. So we're thrilled to have so many folks from the assembly, both fellows, junior faculty, and even those of us who are a little bit more senior to be involved in different ways. Next slide. This is the representatives of the program committee. They have uh, they they met recently and put together the uh, the different um, uh, different parts of the program. Uh, we'll see on the next slide what that is. But uh, for all of you who who are we're grateful for those who submitted abstracts in the last week. The program committee will get be meeting in the next few weeks to put together everything based on all the abstract submissions. So Ben is our chair and Eric Fornow, our chair elect. The next slide, this was just incredibly great news. We actually have 10 scientific symposia being programmed from the PEDS assembly. I don't think we've ever had that many. We know the PEDS year in review is a standing, is one of our standing meetings, depending, pediatric clinical chest rounds where our trainees present as a standing group, but there's eight other scientific symposia, as you can see here, that cover a, uh, a variety of clinical and research topics and advocacy. Next slide. Uh, we also, next, in advance again, we also have uh, one post-grad course. So those are the Friday and Saturday before the meeting officially starts. We have, we have five Meet the Experts. So several folks submitted a variety of topics. Those sessions cost a little bit extra, but those are great for uh, both for trainees as well as faculty. As I mentioned, the abstracts deadline just closed last Wednesday. So the mini symposia, the poster discussion sessions and the thematic poster sessions, those will be put together over the next month or so. And you'll be hearing in, in uh, December and early January about where your abstract will be programmed. Next slide. Just to mention a few other activities of the Pediatric Assembly. Um, there were multiple assembly projects that were submitted for the, um, uh, for the past year, and most of those will be renewed. I can't announce those today because those, uh, those have to be signed off by the Executive Committee, so those will become official uh, in the next month or so. Um, as we know, the web committee is involved in educational programming that, that occurs throughout the year between, between the ATS. Uh, just to highlight, this was, I think this was sent out a few days ago. There is an upcoming town hall at 2 Eastern um, on emerging and re-emerging pediatric infectious disease. So that's going to be a great program. Next slide. As I mentioned uh, already, the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Working Group has been active in and they're one of the assembly projects that will go that will be finalized in the current in the current year. Next slide. So there's a bunch of ways to to get involved. So the first thing is uh, encourage your division to follow ATS. Um, encourage or the pediatric assembly on Twitter. Terry Laguna was also great. The uh, our uh, chair elect was also giving her uh, her Twitter address, and certainly Terry is very active at tweeting. And so these are all ways in which you can connect with your fellow assembly members. I can't say enough about how important it is both for encouraging your division members as well as your trainees to join and attend ATS. I think it's no secret that, that we are an organization where over 50% of our budget, over 60% of our budget, I don't know the exact number, but much of the budget of ATS is based upon attendance at the international conference. And so for ATS to thrive, we need to join in person. Obviously, you know, it's rough years as we're coming out of the pandemic, but I would encourage everyone who can, if you can find ways to get your fellows there, um, we're gonna have a great meeting in Washington, DC next May. And so I'd encourage folks uh, you know, the registration will open up in January. And if at all possible, it's important to get as much of our group there. Besides being a lot of fun, besides all the scientific symposia, 
it's so important just for the financial stability of our organization. You know, Pete's pulmonary, you know, Pete's cardiology and a lot of other our subspecialties have their own groups, but for pediatric pulmonologists, ATS is our home. Um, the, res the Pediatric Resident Development Scholarship has, um, has been an important way to have trainees come to the meeting. That is a, a mechanism for residents who are interested in pediatric pulmonary to come to the meeting. I know the NACF had a, has a similar program that for the conference that just finished. Um, you know, that's something that's at risk for funding just because things really are tight with ATS. We know, I think ATS leadership recognizes this as a priority. And so certainly encourage your folks to attend. Last year, uh, we had over 20, uh, we had 20 folks attend those sessions that, that came to S ATS because of this session. And, and I think it's, as we continue to focus on, on the pipeline and pediatric pulmonology, I think it's a great way to have folks involved. Next. And of course, uh, if you have faculty that are just finding ways, questions about how to, to get involved, certainly reach out to Terry Laguna, reach out to Sharon Dell, reach out to me, uh, reach out to any of us who've been in ATS for a while. Certainly your division directors are great resources, but if you as a division director have someone and you think, you know, they've tried to get involved and we just hadn't found, found the right fit, just reach out to any of us in leadership and we'll partner with you to, to find a way or find a place to be involved. Like I said, over 200 members of our assembly are involved in different committees at this time. And of course, thinking about, we can't, you know, we're, we're focused on ATS 2023, but we know the deadline for 2024 will come in June. You know, the conference is a great way to see the science that's presented and to think about things to, to program for the next year. But this is really, a lot of that planning goes on now. For those of you who submitted proposals, we were thrilled to have 10 that were accepted this year. I think it was also the highest number of proposals that were submitted this year. There were, I think, 35 or so that were submitted. Uh, so it's not, it's no surprise coming out of the pandemic that a lot of folks who'd held things and didn't want to, didn't want to submit virtually. So if you submitted this year and didn't get accepted, do not be discouraged. Continue to work, you know, with your colleagues and think about interesting things to submit. And I think that is all for ATS. I hope I represented. Uh, Terry helped me put together, Terry put together the slides for me. I hope I did right by Terry and Sharon. And, uh, uh, if there's any questions, I'm glad to take those now. Thanks, Paul. Anybody have any questions? Uh, all right. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, Thank you. Let's see. Panina, are you here? I am. All right. Yeah. Welcome. Thanks. So, thank you. Um, so I'm actually going to give the Council of Pediatric Subspecialties as well as the Subspecialty Pediatric Investigators Network, otherwise known as SPIN updates. Um, so if we can just have the next slide. Um, so for those of you, I think most of you know what the Council of Pediatric Subspecialties is. Um, it is one of the few organizations that allows collaboration between all the subspecialties um, to be able to tackle certainly so common problems uh, to all of them. It is also in addition to the individual subspecialties, there are stakeholder representatives from the Association of Pediatric Program Directors, AMSPDAC, which is the uh, chairs, oops, uh, the American Board of Pediatrics, uh, the Academic Pediatric Association, and then COMCEP, which is the organization responsible for medical student education. Um, so it's a great forum in order to discuss, as I said, problems that pertain to all. Next slide. And so one of the important areas that COPS has been involved in, um, and as an aside, I also want to say that uh, Deborah Boyer uh, just recently stepped off. She had been chair of COPS, um, and I'm lucky enough to be on the executive committee because um, I really aspire uh, to be able to do what Deborah does. So uh, I've got a great role model and uh, Deborah put into place uh, a lot of these initiatives. And so 
COPS is very um, integrated in terms of workforce. Uh, there are four different domains and there's kind of a lead uh, in each of these domains. So one is to change the educational paradigm and that includes recruiting um, to undersubscribed subspecialties such as pediatrics. Uh, that's actually led by APPD. Uh, domain number two, which is uh, both COPS and the American Board of Pediatrics is data needs and access. Um, and that is actually um, looking at a lot of, you know, certainly the things you, you saw the um, link to the American Board of Pediatrics, the workforce. Many of you know about the UNC uh, Chef Center Pediatrics Subspecialty Modeling Project, um, or you may be or you may be hearing it later on. Um, and this is actually looking at not only physician workforce, but other things such as DOs, IMGs, APPs, um, and certainly uh, in terms of, you'll hear about DEI, but um, the American Board of Pediatrics has recently been collecting data on underrepresented in medicine um, in terms of the physician workforce, which is really important. Domain, domain number three is economic strategy, and that's led by AMSPDEC. And uh, AMSPDEC actually reviewed uh, some of its preliminary data. One of their projects is looking at what constitutes an FTE. Um, and so they have some very interesting data, which uh, they should drill down into the subspecialty to figure out, again, in pediatric pulmonology, what represents a full-time FTE. And then domain number four is early exposure and integration. And that is led by COMSEP, which is the medical student uh, organ or medical student education organization. Um, and they're actually doing work about, you know, uh, early exposure to both pediatrics um, as well as the subspecialties. Uh, next. And then what does COPS involved in? Uh, you've heard some of the activities uh, that certainly pertain to us. One is the ACGME decision about fellowship program director and fellowship program coordinator protected time, uh, which um, COPS along with APPD, obviously, I mean, we realize the impact, which is gonna be significant in terms of protected time, for the fellowship program directors who are in the larger programs, or at least uh, those who have four to six fellows. Um, and so certainly uh, COPS and APPD are um, putting in objections uh, to the recent change. Uh, but again, unfortunately, I think it was a sequelae of trying to make uniform across all the specialties uh, the protected time. And I think we were. Uh, I want to say a casualty of it. Um, in terms of fellowship recruitment, uh, COPS worked with APPD to make recommendations for virtual fellowship recruitment. Um, and again, are looking at 2023 to 2024, which PEPTID is certainly will be very um, instrumental in terms of figuring out virtual recruitment going forward. Uh, other things are transition from resident to fellow, and then, you know, kind of the second looks. Um, there was a survey of fellowship program directors that looked at the benefits and limitations of virtual recruitment uh, in pediatrics. Um, again, Deborah was an integral member of that, and most recently aligning pediatrics and internal medicine subspecialty match. Um, for recruitment into pediatrics, uh, there are webinars which highlight a subspecialty every other month. And uh, that should be for uh, med students and residents and pediatric pulmonology already had its time in the sun. Uh, there are also fellowships, uh, spe sub specialty specific recruitment fairs. Uh, the last one was in July. It was kind of, I wanna say a pilot. And so there was certainly some kinks in it. Um, it will occur earlier next year. And there were 39 fellowship program directors and 40 residents or students that participated. And for the fellowship program directors, uh, it should be noted that if you look at all the trainees who attended, 50% visited uh, programs that weren't on their list. And 37% actually applied to programs that hadn't been on their list. So it's a great way to get some face time with uh, our residents. 
And then COMSEP is doing future PEDS webinars for the med students in terms of subspecialties in pediatrics. Um, and they're actually looking at some interesting data in terms of factors that influence pediatrics as a choice, thinking about our pipeline. And then they're looking at pediatric programs that have the highest number of students going into PEDS to figure out uh, what characteristics they might share. Next. Um, and then lastly, the SPOT or subspecialist perspectives on training. Um, and it's basically the top five items that every GP should know about Pete's pulmonology. And this uh, certainly Peptido was very instrumental in coming up with. Next. And then um, all the subspecialties were asked to share their workforce initiatives. And there were some really, really interesting things that came from the other subspecialties, such as grants for students from HBCUs to go to national meetings, collaborating with the AAP on visiting professorship programs at HBCUs, um, videos such as allergy immunology about why choose a career in the subspecialty, uh, particip participation in med student showcase at the AMA annual meeting. Um, for fellows, uh, they had a research mentoring program, job search strategies, and that was in GI and neonatology. Uh, fellowship program directors had virtual cafes uh, that, and again, this is like in specific subspecialties, looking at holistic review of applications. Um, there were some two subspecialties that did burnout surveys, which was nephrology and GI. Um, and it was kind of interesting. I think it was from nephrology, maybe it was GI. Uh, burnout more likely in those under 44 years and seven, and those who had seven or more clinical sessions per week. Again, just ideas from other subspecialties that perhaps um, uh, we could think about. And then women in neonatology had monthly webinars, negotiation, parenting, gender pay equity, and then virtual training for APPs. Next. And then there's a lot of uh, talk and discussion about the difference in lifetime potential between pediatric and adult physicians in black is peds on the left, oh, I'm sorry, and gray is in adults. And I put the arrow by pulmonology as well as the difference between pediatric pulmonology and the other subspecialties. And so there's a lot of discussion about that. And next. Um, and this was my, uh, this was my spin as uh, being on the advisory board with Jan Rama is that uh, we have completed, so what SPIN is important uh, among other things is that uh, it is a, um, all, it's, it's, there's representation from all the subspecialties and hopefully the idea is that we generate data which will support the use of the EPAs and kind of thinking about what um, one might need to graduate and so we completed the top two studies already. Pediatric pulmonology has always had a great representation. And then uh, the bottom two studies are coming up. And uh, we really encourage the fellowship program directors to continue to participate. And as you can see, they're on extremely important uh, areas um, of concern to all of us. Uh, so thank you. And if anybody wants, because I might have gone over seven minutes, put questions in the chat. Thanks, Panina. That was great. It's amazing how much work you, uh, the organization does. Okay. Uh, let's see. Robin, are you here? I am here. Hello. Hello. Nice to see everybody. Um, so I'm just going to give the update on, I was told that we, um, we don't qualify to be called a working group or an interest group that we have to be called an advisory group. Um, so this is your update from the PEDS Assembly DEI advisory group on behalf of our awesome leadership team of Eric Forno, Terry Laguna, Stephanie levinsky Desir, Paul Moore, Beverly Shears, and Nicole Stevenson. Next slide. Um, so just for those of you who um, hadn't heard about this advisory group before, um, it all started out in 2020 um, after the murder of George Floyd and in the setting of increased awareness about COVID related health disparities and a discussion at one of these meetings, um, the then PEDS Assembly Chair Paul Moore convened a small group to address DEI and pediatric pulmonology 
Um, and so that summer, we formed a DEI leadership team for um, what we called a new working group that later became an advisory group. And we elicited nominations um, over base camp from division directors for participants in a larger DEI working group to supplement this smaller leadership team. And we got some great nominations. Um, we were looking for people at all career levels, um, members from underrepresented groups, as well as allies, people who hadn't found their home in the assembly in terms of involvement, people who are looking for networking opportunities and some scholarship. And so we ended up with a great group of about um, 22 or 23 people. And we established three subcommittees and invited the, new, the members of this larger working group to select an area of interest, either um, a pipeline subgroup um, that focused on recruitment into our field, a training subcommittee that focuses on DEI issues specifically during fellowship training, and then a committee, a subcommittee that focuses on faculty development and retention of pediatric pulmonologists. And one of the first things we realized that we needed to do was to conduct a needs assessment just to see where we are as an assembly and as a specialty um, to figure out what you know, where our efforts should springboard into. Next slide. Um, we quickly learned that in order to design and then ultimately administer a survey to our member membership, we had to get official approval from ATS. And the way to do that was through an assembly project. And so we wrote an assembly project proposal to administer a needs assessment survey and then hold a workshop and write an official ATS workshop report on DEI in the pediatric pulmonary workforce. And once um, that proposal was accepted, which we were very grateful for, that gave us official approval to administer a survey to the PEDS assembly. And so since our, our the, the springboard that, you know, the incidents that um, brought us together to do this work was really around, racial and ethnic diversity, that was the focus of the needs assessment survey. And so we sent, um, we decided that our intended audience for the survey was going to be pediatric pulmonary attendings and fellows in the United States and Canada. And we were interested both in ATS members, obviously, but but any member of our, of our specialty. And so members and non-members of the ATS. And so the survey opened on the Friday of the international meeting, and it went for about two and a half weeks until June 1st. And, um, and we sort of advertised this um, web uh, internet-based survey through assembly-wide emails. It was enthousi enthusiastically advertised at ATS. Um, we had some engagement with the, the groups here, with the division directors and the fellowship training directors. And then we also did some advertising over Twitter. Um, and then our survey closed on June 1st after, like I said, about 17 days. Next slide. And so in that time, we got 317 respondents, which we were really happy about because that it wasn't open for very long. Um, and so you can see here a little bit about who responded to the survey. So we had about 55% of our respondents were women and 19.6% uh, were self-identified as underrepresented in medicine with the groups that you see here. Um, and you can see here what the um, race and ethnicity breakdown of the survey respondents. So the majority of respondents were white um, with about 6.6% .6 of African-American and um, about 10% were Hispanic. And we don't really have a great denominator to know, you know, what percentage of um, board certified pediatric pulmonologists and fellows um, are out there and what 317 you know, what proportion of that is. Um, but we were really happy with this, um, with this response rate. So next slide. And um, you can see here that we, we actually got 68 fellows to complete the survey, which was great because we really do, did want to hear from the fellows and then a good representation of faculty um, in the early, mid and senior career stages. And then we had a few people who are no longer in academic medicine, but are in pharma um, and so, you know, we were we were pretty happy with this as well. Next slide. 
So we asked some questions about the DEI climate at respondents, institutions, departments, and in divisions. And in general, people were aware of um, the existence of DEI policies, DEI offices, um, and some DEI programming at the institution level in terms of opportunities for um, mentoring of and for underrepresented groups, um, fostering sort of a climate of accept acceptance, official um, avenues for reporting. Um, and I would say that these things were more available uh, Respondents reported that they were more available on the institution level, um, definitely widely available at the department level, and then whether or not there were, were pediatric pulmonary division specific initiatives available in large part depended on the size of the division. So very small divisions obviously had less programming specifically targeting these issues as compared to much larger divisions. Um, and there were a lot of, you know, you had the opportunity to say, I don't know if something like this exists. And so it was clear that awareness of um, different policies, programs, and opportunities um, also varied um, among the respondents. We also asked about experiencing and witnessing racism, other forms of discrimination, microaggressions, and gaslighting. And, um, and large numbers of trainees and even larger numbers of faculty um, experienced and witnessed all of the um, all of the above. And so not surprisingly, more people reported that they witnessed these things than personally experienced them. But still, um, still, there were a large number of respondents who did experience racism, discrimination, microaggression and gaslighting. And the faculty were more likely to report that they experienced and witnessed these things compared to trainees. Next slide. I'm going to get in. We'll get into substantial detail about this when the workshop report comes out. I can't like steal the thunder for our publication, but I just wanted to give some broad over, you know, broad strokes overviews. And so in July, we had a two day workshop. Um, and so here are your workshop co-chairs, um, Nicole, Terry, Paul, Beverly, me, Stephanie, and Eric. Um, next slide. And these were our workshop participants. And so the top on the top line, the top three people on the top line were our um, DEI faculty experts. And so we have Monica Lipson from Columbia, and she's an associate dean of the med school at Columbia, and she has a, a large role in DEI at her institution. Um, Leslie Walker Harding, who is the chair of pediatrics in Seattle, and then David Wilkes, um, who was the is the dean emeritus of the medical school at the University of Virginia, and also the director of the Har Harold Amos Foundation, which um, is part of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and it's a career development program for underrepresented minorities. Um, in medicine, and then um, Tracy Kesmerski and M. Fon Udoko, who are on the top um, right, the top line on the right, also did some qualitative analysis for the survey. So of the 317 respondents, over 150 um, answered, like had extensive free text answers to some of the questions that we asked. And so they helped us with a qualitative analysis. And then the bottom two rows are our workshop participants, ranging from fellow, um, trainees to, you know, division chiefs and program directors and full professors and everything in between. Um, and so it was just really a fantastic two days um, where we had, we presented the results of the survey, the, our faculty um, DEI leadership gave talks, and then we had breakout sessions discussing each one of the subcommittee topics. Next slide. Um, and so here are some of the highlights and lessons learned from our two-day workshop, sort of putting together some of the themes that emerged between the survey, what our DEI leaders spoke to us about in our breakout discussions. Um, and so in terms of pathway and pipeline into pediatric pulmono pulmonology, um, the, the data about just the number of underrepresented minorities who are entering college is sobering that that number has been really flat over time. And so when we think about where we're gonna be recruiting the next generation of physicians into our field, when you look at the number of people, underrepresented minorities who are entering college, um, it's a little bit of a crisis. And that number actually fell a bit during the 
COVID pandemic because of financial obligations that people had to their families and had to put college off. Um, and the point was just made over and over again that recruitment of underrepresented physicians really needs to start much earlier than thinking about how we're going to get residents into pulmonary fellowships. Like we need to start nurturing, um, you know, individuals when they're in middle and high school. Um, and that was that just came up over and over again. Um, in terms of recruitment, both into training programs and into faculty positions, there was a lot of emphasis about prioritizing DEI from the top down. And um, David Wilkes, who was the dean of the UVA med school, talked about efforts that he, as the dean of the med school, made in contacting residency applicants, fellowship applicants, um, and young faculty. Um, as the dean of the med school, that he made the effort to reach out to people and to say, you will have a home here, you will be supported here, because we are making DEI a priority at our institution, starting with me as the dean of the medical school. Um, you know, and you know, other examples that were given about intentional proactive engagement, um, being sure that we're recruiting from diverse venues like HBCUs and um, other places, um, standardizing recruitment procedures and standardized search committees so that you're you're redu you're introducing as little bias into the process as possible and ensuring that before a decision is made about offering someone a position that you're you have ensured that you have a diverse pool from what you're choosing um, as well as inter addressing the intersections of race gender and lgbtq bias um, there's a lot of discussion um, in terms of retention about the minority tax both in terms of the activity burden that is placed upon underrepresented faculty and, and constantly being asked to lead DEI activities or be on this search committee and um, as well as the heavier financial and family burdens that, that many individuals already bring with them, um, the amount of financial debt that they're, um, that they're carrying, et cetera, and um, trying to address the, those two forms of the minority tax. Um, we talked a lot about climate, fostering inclusive environments, and being intentionally anti-racist, um, and including transparency in that, um, specifically around you know, reporting, and then how you address reports of harassment and discrimination and being transparent about what the outcomes of those reports are. Um, and then in terms of promotion, talking about giving formal credit and compensation for DEI activities, um, as well as offering opportunities for formal training in the mentorship, allyship, coaching, and sponsorship of underrepresented um, individuals. Next slide. And so our next steps, we are furiously in the writing phase now, um, trying to put our workshop report together with the goal of um, submitting this in January. And then Terry Laguna actually put together a scientific symposium proposal for ATS where we're going to really dive in deeper to the results of what we learned from the survey and just talk a little bit about the, a little bit more about the themes that came up in our workshop report. And I think that is everything that I have. Anyway. Thanks, Robin. Um, good luck writing. Uh, we're definitely <laughs> excited to see the results. <laughs> We've been writing for a while and it's coming along well. The only problem is we're only given 4,500 words and we have, you know, three times that of what we want to say. So that's going to be the biggest challenge is cutting it down to fit the word count. But stay tuned. <laughs> that's really great work. Okay, um, let's see everyone. I think we're just past the hour here. So Allie, are we gonna break off into the breakout rooms now?